Hi everyone, welcome back to the Region Park TV weekly news show. My name is Humaira Rahman and I am here today with my co-host Fred and Murphy. Today we are here to present the news that impacts the Region Park and surrounding neighborhoods. In this episode, we present the following news for the week from April 6th to April 13th, 2022. Today we are going to be covering stories with the headlines of SDP Planning Committee discusses youth leadership, report of March 24th, SDP meeting Arrest made after fatal stabbing in Toronto's Regent Park area Chevron Street property could be expropriated and used for affordable housing Indigenous report The Pope apologizes for abuse of Indigenous children in Canada's residential schools Temporary homeless shelters in Toronto hotels to start closing this spring Ford government pledges to increase minimum wage to $15.50. COVID-19 and vaccination update. Toronto's top doctor asks residents to put masks back on. Vaccine clinics in Regent Park area. As well as events and jobs in the Regent Park community. SDP Planning Committee discusses youth leadership. Report of March 24, SDP meeting. The Regent Park Social Development Plan is a community-wide initiative aimed at building social cohesion and inclusion. The plan revolves around four priority areas, each represented by a working committee. The four working groups are communication, safety, community building, and employment and economic development. The body tasked with coordinating the four working groups is the SDP Planning Committee. The committee comprises of all the other members of the working groups and subcommittees. The March 31st, 2022 meeting of the SDP Planning Committee was held over Zoom and chaired by Walid Kogali, a TCHC resident member. After a reading of the purpose of the committee, the meeting began with a presentation from Gail Lynch about the monthly Employment and Economic Development Committee. Gail presented data related to a survey of the committee's work for the month of March. According to Gail, the great majority of attendees of the ENED Working Group is TCHC residents, and there is a variety of ways that members used to get information about the meetings. Gail also reported that despite service providers' involvement in the committee, there is still not an agency co-chair for the group. One issue that was raised was around the need for youth employment mentorship. The committee will be doing more work in the future to explore this issue. An issue regarding the need for a kitchen that would support the activities of all the working groups in the SDP. The next issue that was presented was from Murgwan Kogali, a resident member, related to youth representation. Murwan feels that youth should be involved in all the working committees of the SDP and that there should be a youth co-chair for each of the four working group. In response, Dini Peters, an agency member, stated that only having a single youth as co-chair, it's tokenism and not real representation. One or two youth at a meeting is not youth engagement. Isa Ali from Youth Empowering Youth agreed with Dini, stating that youth don't feel comfortable in adult structures and spaces, and it would be better for youth to have their own spaces where youth could provide input on their own needs. Diana Mavunduse, an agency member, was also in agreement. Morgan adamantly disagreed and argued passionately about the need to give youth leadership roles on each of the committees. Members cited on one side of the issue or the other. Ismail Afra argued that to implement a youth co-chair position on each of the committees, it would require changes in the terms of reference. However, there is nothing to prevent youth from participating on the committees or to have a youth chair on the committee as a representative of a TCHC or market co-chair. Michael Rosenberg argued that the issue is youth engagement and leadership, and it's not about having a youth co-chair or not. Joel Klassen made a suggestion that Morgan should convene a meeting with youth where he explains that the SCP is and how they would like to participate. Richard Kirwan from the city reminded the group that the youth make up a huge part of the Regent Park population and that if youth are not part of the SDP, then there is a huge population that is missing. Ismail concluded the conversation by saying that no one is against having youth engaged in the SDP. The question is how? 
It was agreed that Moore One will lead a conversation on how to involve youth at the upcoming alignment meeting. Arrest made after fatal stabbing in Toronto's Regent Park area. An arrest has been made after a man identified as Abdi Jama, 58 years old of Toronto, was stabbed to death in the Regent Park area around 5.15 p.m. on Saturday, April 2nd. Toronto police said the man was found injured on the ground at Ontario and Shutter Streets at 8.15 p.m. He was taken by ambulance to hospital where he was pronounced dead. On Sunday, April 3rd, Shamar James, 30 years old of Toronto, was arrested and charged with one count of second degree murder. He was scheduled to attend court on April 4th. Abdi Jama is the city's 18th murder victim of 2022. Sherburne Street property could be expropriated and used for affordable housing. Regent Park Community Health Center Advocacy Committee and the Shelter and Housing Justice Network are disappointed that after nearly 10 years of organizing by many organizations and the people in the community, the City of Toronto has failed to purchase the property at 214 230 Sherborne Street. The City made an offer to purchase the properties for affordable housing but lost the bid. The properties were sold to developers and will likely become a condominium. However, the city has the power to expropriate the site for social housing. There is a report before the executive committee that outlines the city's attempt to acquire the property. Organizations and councillor Kristen Wong Tam depute to express support for proceeding with expropriation at the oncoming council meeting. And look, all around us are people who are, are suffering, deeply suffering from the lack of, of housing, the lack of high quality housing. Let's do something about that. City Council responded to that motion and said, yeah, why don't the staff go off and try to negotiate a deal with the, with the seller? instead of expropriating. Let me tell you what would have happened if we moved to expropriate. What we would have been able to do was buy the property four years earlier. We would have bought it at half the price that we are now trying to buy it for today. And we probably have people moving in. That's what would have happened if we took action sooner. So why do it now? Because we're not building enough housing and the housing crisis has gotten much, much worse. There's only one way forward to ending the homelessness and shelter and housing crisis. There's only one way, and that way is build more housing, deeply affordable, rent geared to housing, supportive housing now. So we can't wait anymore. The property at 214 230 Sherbourne Street has sat vacant for over 10 years while the ravages of the housing and homelessness crisis decimate a community outside its doors. And today we present the Indigenous Report. The Pope apologizes for abuse of Indigenous children in Canada's residential schools. After a visit with delegations from Indigenous leaders of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis, last week, Pope Francis has made a historic apology to Indigenous peoples for the deplorable abuses they suffered in Canada's Catholic-run residential schools. The Pope said he felt sorrow and shame for how Indigenous people were treated in Canada. The papal apology comes months after the remains of hundreds of children were found on the grounds of former residential schools in Canada. La deplorable conduct of those members of the Catholic Church, I ask pardon to God. I would like to tell you with all my heart, I am very sorry. And I am one of my brothers and sisters of Canada. I ask you to excuse me. I will be happy to benefit from the encounter with you, visiting your native country dove vivono le vostre famiglie. Non ci andrò in inverno voi, eh? 
Vi do allora l'arrivederci in Canada, dove potrò meglio esprimervi la mia vicinanza. Last week, Pope Francis had meetings with the indigenous leaders as well as survivors of the residential schools in Canada who traveled to the Vatican to demand an apology. The meetings were supposed to take place last December, but were delayed due to the pandemic. It should never have ever, ever happened. Unfortunately, it has. It has its history. And so we're here to tell you the truth. Our preference is for the, it's for the Holy Father to come to Canada, apologize on Canadian soil, and do it on one of our territories. That is our hope and wish. And we made that very clear to, uh, to the Holy Father. The Pope and the Church has an expressed a sentiment of working towards reconciliation. He shared words about the shame and sorrow that the Church feels for the history concerning the unmarked graves. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau welcomed Pope Francis' apology to Canada's Indigenous people, calling it a step forward. I want to acknowledge Pope Francis' apology for the Church's role in the abuses that took place in the residential school system. We look forward to him coming to Canada to deliver that apology in person. Today's apology is a step forward in acknowledging the truth of our past in order to right historical wrongs, but there's still work to be done. Temporary homeless shelters in Toronto hotels to start closing this spring. The City of Toronto could begin to decommission temporary shelter spaces that were set up to help people experiencing homelessness during the COVID-19 pandemic. But advocates worry the move will put a strain on those experiencing homelessness. Two of the five temporary homeless shelters to be closed by May 15th are the Better Living Center on Princess Boulevard and the former Days Inn Hotel on Queen Street East. The Better Living Center to be closed April 30th has been operating for 17 months. The other locations will be identified in the coming months, the city says. As public health guidelines change, the city says it wants to make plans to transition out of these sites. Homeless advocates for their part say the plan is concerning because it means the loss of shelter beds and worry it will be difficult to offset the loss. They also say their plan will create stress and anxiety among shelter hotel residents because temporary homeless shelters are closing on a series of different dates. Dr. H.A. Withers, a steering committee member of the Shelter and Housing Justice Network, said the plan is not clear and it is just unjust. There's not really a plan here. They're continuing to try and shamble together things with a shelter system that is in collapse. They continue to scramble with an overly full system that they're piecing together from a variety of different, totally inadequate places where there are really inhuman conditions, Wither said. The Ford government pledges to increase minimum wage to $15.50. The Ford government has announced another increase to the minimum wage in Ontario. The province announced the minimum wage will be going up 50 cents on October 1st, 2022 to $15.50 a move that is tied to the increased rate of inflation. It's one more way we're fighting for everyday people and delivering real positive change for over 700,000 workers in communities right across our province. This third raise in one year builds on our government's increase to $15 an hour in January 2022. 
when we joined labor leaders and announced we were also removing the lower minimum wage rate for liquor servers. The Conservatives are also promising the student minimum wage would go to $14.60 per hour, a raise from $14.10 per hour. Other provincial parties are making promises to boost the minimum wage if elected. The opposition New Democrats have said they will raise the minimum wage to $16 as of October 1st if elected to form the government and bring the wage to $20 per hour in 2026. The Liberals are promising a wage increase to $16 per hour by January 1st 2023 if they are elected. And now with the COVID-19 and vaccination updates, Toronto top doctors asked residents to put masks back on as well as vaccine clinics in the Regent Park area. Toronto's top doctors are urging residents to return to wearing masks in public indoor settings amid a rise in COVID-19 transmissions in the city. During a press conference, Toronto Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen De Vila, said that she doesn't believe mandates are appropriate at this point in the pandemic, given that they were always intended to be a temporary tool for a time when few other protections existed. But she said that she is encouraging Torontonians to continue wearing masks as much as possible, especially with COVID-19 circulating in the community to the degree it is now. The head of Ontario Science Table has also estimated that Ontario is likely already seeing somewhere between 30,000 and 35,000 new infections per day and could be trending towards the worst case scenario outlined in modeling that was released last month. We should expect that from time to time we are going to have to adjust our behaviour to use all the layers of self-protection that we have at our disposal to respond appropriately to the COVID-19 activity in our community. This is one of those times. Divila said on Monday, wearing a mask is a simple thing you can do, especially if you are older, have older people in your life, have a serious health condition, or simply are indoors with people you do not know. The number of people in Ontario hospitals with COVID-19 has risen by more than 30% over the last week and now stands at 857. Now with vaccine clinics in Regent Park areas. The Regent Park Community Health Centre is still running a COVID vaccination and testing clinic at 40 Oak Street, servicing the community of Regent Park and anyone living with the M postal code. Starting April 1st, the vaccine clinic will be running on Tuesdays and Saturdays only. Walk-ins are welcome as long as supplies last. Appointments for the fourth dose are available on the vaccination booking page. Pfizer is available for all age groups. Children aged from 5 to 11 years old are now eligible to receive Pfizer vaccine. A mixed clinic will be running at 40 Oak on Saturdays from 9.30 a.m. to 1 o'clock p.m. For more information on eligibility, testing, different age clinics, and bookings, please visit regionparkchc.org slash COVID-19 vaccine clinic. The Sherburne Health Center is running a pop-up vaccine clinic on April 12th and 19th from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. at the corner of 200 Wellesley Street East and from 4 to 8 p.m. at 260 Community Manor Space. For pre-registration, call 416-347-0943. OHIP is not required and walk-ins are always welcome. Now with the weekly COVID-19 vaccine clinic at the 519. You can access your COVID-19 vaccine at our low barrier drop-in clinic. This clinic is open for 2S LGBTQ plus communities and allies, everyone above the ages of 12. Moderna and Pfizer are also available at this clinic. Ontario Health Card is not necessary, but good to bring along if you have it. The first, second, and third doses are available for those eligible. There are limited doses, so it is going to be first come, first serve. If you have any questions or concerns, you can always email them at community at the 519.org. We continue with Humira with events and jobs in Regent Park community. Thank you, Fred. Now I'll be talking about some events that will be happening in the Regent Park area. Ramadan Iftar 2022, meals by the Regent Park Catering Collective. This event is primarily for Regent Park residents to join in on Wednesdays in April to break fast and pray Maghrib all together. The dates are April 6th, April 13th, the 20th, 27th from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. at Daniel Spectrum, which is 585 Dundas Street East. 
All meals are free with the option to dine in or take out. Some more exciting news to follow is Regent Park Sewing Lessons are back. The six-week program will once run again at the Center for Learning and Development at 540 Dundas Street East every Saturday starting April 2nd to May 7th. It is from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. The beginner workshop will be running from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. and the more advanced workshop will be running from 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. You can learn to sew using recycled materials and fabric as well as how to do a simple alterations. Class availability and child minings is for Regent Park residents only. To register or for more information, contact Adriana at 416-799-6006 or Urfa at 547-450-3463 or you can also email Adriana MoPRP at gmx.com. The Focus Media Arts Center invites you to learn video game development. Starting April 6th all the way to June 29, 2022, every Wednesday from 5 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. This free in-person game development workshop will teach you how to make your very own video game. You will be learning C Sharp programming and Unity Engine. This free workshop is available for youth age 15 to 25 and will take place on the Daniel Spectrums, 585 Dundas Street, third floor. You can register online at www.regionparkfocus.gamedev.html or email info at focusmediaarts.ca. Bridges and Mental Health Counseling Services at the Young Street Mission will be facilitating a hybrid trauma and transformation group for our community members. This in-person and virtual programming will be starting from April 26th and running for eight weeks until June 16, 2022. The group will focus on understanding trauma, how to build and maintain safety and stability, as well as learning coping skills to manage trauma symptoms. TNT sessions will include mindfulness, prayer, meditation, educational content, discussion, and take-home resources, amongst other things. To register for this group and to find out if you fit the criteria to participate, please email counselor kngreen at kgreen at ysm.ca or counselor Ruth Porter at rporter at ysm.ca. Now I bring to you jobs and opportunities in the Regent Park area. Focus Media Arts Center is looking to hire a part-time communications outreach coordinator for the Regent Park Social Development Plan or the SDP's Communication Working Group. The working group is one of the four pillars of the SDP and the successful candidate will be reporting to it. In supporting the communication working group, the communication outreach coordinator will employ the use of online, phone, in-person, and social media strategies to increase the promotion, reach, engagements of all communication table initiatives such as Regent Park TV, the Hello Neighbor app, and the Regent Park newsletter. Furthermore, they will assist with the development and implementation of outreach strategies that will promote the activities and initiatives of the SDP and its four working groups as a whole. The part-time position includes eight hours of work per week at a rate of $25 per hour. The contract period is from April 18, 2022 to March 31, 2023. The deadline to apply is coming up shortly. For more information in this posting and to apply, send an email with your cover letter and resume to info at focusmediaarts.ca. Dixon Hall is offering a youth incubator program in collaboration with George Brown and the Labor Education Center. This is an eight-week training program in hospitality or trade streams that provides valuable certification for job seekers. They are now accepting youth aged 18 to 29 who are on Ontario Works. Participants will receive $750 from Dixon Hall for training support. The Youth Incubator Program is set to begin on April 19, 2022. For more information or to participate, please contact Program Coordinator Denzel at 416-889-5768. The Center for Learning and Development is offering a free online food entrepreneurship program starting on April 25, 2022. Program participants can expect to learn valuable skills and required knowledge for launching or scaling a food business with a focus on food entrepreneurship with fundamentals such as food regulations, safe food and handling process, marketing promotions and e-commerce, food industry trends, scaling operations and products, permits and license. You can register online at info at tccld.org or you can also phone 
647-493-2462 and press 1 for programs and registrations. And that'll be all for the jobs and events happening in the Regent Park area. My name is Kumara Rahman and hopefully see you all there. Have a good one, folks. And that's all for today's show. My name is Murphy Brown and my co-hosts are Fred Alvarado and Humera. We would also like to thank our team of researchers who contributed to this week's show. And from our studios at Focus Media Arts Center, thanks for watching and see you next week. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out all of our social media platforms. For more information, check out our website.